Voyager's got a problem. All over the ship, lights are going off and systems powering down. The good news is that Balana's back after her totally mystery absence for the last few episodes, and, on an unrelated note, we're filming her abdomen again now. They even let her keep the jacket. She and Ensign Conspicuous, who we've not really seen since Balana dislocated his jaw, are looking at the warp core while engineering dims the lights. Up on the bridge, Kim tells us all that the ship has cut power to a number of decks and disabled pretty much anything non-essential. As an aside, he includes the holodecks in this list, which is odd as we established they run off a separate, dedicated power source that can't be used by the main grid. The reason for Voyager being switched to energy saving mode is because we're running low on deuterium, the juice that powers our warp core. As another aside, I was under the impression that the glowy red tips on our warp engines were Boussard collectors for passive gathering of deuterium. Maybe we've been in a particularly spacey part of space for a while. Janeway wants further ideas from the crew for power savings, but we're running out of things to turn off. Things are already so desperate that we're limiting the areas with life support, which is why we're all bunking up together and we'll have to make do with limited space, a concept Neelix struggles with. Chakotay arrives in Astrometrics to see why it's still running after being ordered to shut down. Seven says she's still using it to look for fuel sources, as it's more effective, though less efficient, than standard scanners. And Astrometrics itself agrees, discovering a source of deuterium that she says normal scanners would have missed, which is odd given that it's an entire bloody planet, but we'll let that go. The source is rich, but, Chicote explains, rather problematic. You see, the planet is Demon Classification, also known as Class Y, presumably standing for why the fuck would anybody want to visit their shithole. Radiation, high temperatures, acid lakes, demon planets sport the sort of conditions that would place them around a 4.5 on the danger table. In short, it's probably death, but the alternative is actual death, so probable death is appealing by comparison. To planet Death Trap we go. We've done science things to the shield so we can stay in orbit without melting, though we aren't told how long that'll last based on the power shortages. Time to try and teleport some of that delicious deuterium directly to the ship so we don't have to go to the surface. An unfortunately timed radiation wibbly from the surface causes a few kabooms, and the whole thing goes tits up. It also knocks out the teleporters for good measure, so we'll need to find another way. Probes will melt, and we've all forgotten that the shuttles have their own teleporters, but Kim has an idea. He wants to fly down there in a shuttle and mine the stuff manually in an environment suit. Both shuttle and suit will need to be modified, presumably in ways that can't be done to a probe because reasons, and he'll be unable to contact Voyager if shit goes south. Not to worry, as he volunteers Paris to go with him and help. Tuvok and Janeway exchange a look, and immediately agree to the plan. After they leave, Paris expresses surprise at Kim being assertive in a meeting. Kim explains that it's because he's been considering his place here. He might have been the new guy when he joined, but that was nearly four years back. He may still be the least experienced, but that's not the same as having none, and he's already seen more stuff than some captains ever do. After four seasons, is this finally the episode where Kim gets his personality? A shuttlecraft is flying through some beige candy floss, and the use of an older Type 6 makes me wonder if Janeway didn't want to risk losing one of the good ones on this fool's errand. In a shocking turn of events, they don't crash. Out Paris and Kim go in their environment suits, and we're reminded that it's very hot indeed, though apparently not hot enough for him to worry about the seal on his helmet. Tangentially, why do these helmets have windows on the back? Does the Federation include a species with rear-facing eyes? Enough of that shit, as Kim's detected the deuterium we need, we discover a curiously silvery pool in a cave, and one that's at an abnormally low temperature, considering the environment. As all Starfleet personnel are taught in the Academy, the best thing to do when presented with something unknown is to split up, so Kim sends Paris to examine a different pool a few metres away. After a bit of a monologue, Paris realises he's talking to himself, and returns to discover a distinct lack of Kim. That silvery pool also now has some eddies and bubbles in it. Paris reaches in and finds something to tug on, happily discovering that it's Kim's arm once it reaches the surface. Once rescued, Kim describes not quite understanding what happened, and a feeling of having been pulled in. Still, no harm done. Oh, wait, harm done. Kim has a suit breach, and one that somehow left him with only 30 seconds of oxygen. As Paris tries to help Kim back to the shuttle, we see a gloop of silvery shite to get absorbed into Paris's suit. A warning message tells Paris that his suit is compromised now too, and he only has 30 seconds left as well. Some fruitless struggling ends with him lying on the floor next to Kim. Guess that's what you get for not offering to share your oxygen, like Balana did for him at the start of the season. What a dick. 
Neelix has thought of a solution for his sleeping arrangements. Not happy with the idea of bunking down in the mess hall with everybody else, he's hit upon the idea of using sick bay. They even have beds. The doc's unimpressed by the idea and complains to Chakotay, who tells him he can be disabled if that's preferable. Chakotay leaves and a satisfied Neelix beds down with the others who caught on to his plan. Up on the bridge, Janeway's a little concerned for that shuttle she sent down to the planet. Oh, and Paris and Kim, I guess. Chakotay arrives and asks if she wants him to pop down in another shuttle and find them, but she thinks that's too dangerous. Far smarter, she says, to land the whole ship. The planet has deuterium and we're not going to make it anywhere else with what we've got. We either get some here or we're screwed anyway. Tuvok points out that we might not survive the descent, but I'd argue it's a better chance than when Voyager loses power and its orbit decays anyway. Janeway's of the same mind and we set about parking the ship. The descent is a little shaky and we get some sparks and fog from the bridge consoles. Voyager pokes out its cute little feetsies and stomps into the ground. We're down, but we're also proper dinged up, so we'll be staying for a while. Chakotay's going to go and look for Paris and Kim while repairs are underway. Bellano wants to come too, but is shut down by Chakotay. She's in no position to think rationally, and there's no room for fuck-ups on this away mission. She takes the hint, going so far as to suggest Seven of Nine instead. That's about as far from emotionally invested as you can get, and Chakotay agrees. Chakotay and Seven arrive on Planet Death Trap to discover that it's still a shithole. The shuttle's empty, and Seven says their environment suits would have been buggered by now. They carry on looking anyway, eventually finding a cave with that silvery goop in it. Seven wants to grab a sample, and opens the case she's been carrying to reveal randomly numbered jars. She picks the one labelled 758, perhaps as a reference to the year in which Empress Koken of Japan abdicated and was succeeded by her adopted son, Junin. He would, of course, become Japan's 47th emperor. Before she touches the pool, Chakotay pulls her back and says we should focus on Paris and Kim before doing science bollocks. She defers and joins him as they explore deeper in the cave. It's Chakotay's turn for peril as a ledge gives way beneath him. He's left dangling over a swirling pool of that metallic stuff, and Seven's struggling to pull him back up. If I didn't know any better, I'd say it's the same ledge that Sebastian Shitpants was hanging off in the first episode of Season 3, the one where he got eaten by Shai Hulud. Just as well, then, that Paris turns up to save him, and out of his environment suit to boot. He looks pretty healthy for someone who's currently in an environment that's over 200 degrees Celsius, and the lack of oxygen hasn't done him any harm either. He tells them that he was dying, but then didn't, which is pretty bloody selfish of him, frankly. He had a nap just before doing a dead, and woke up with the ability to breathe whatever soup this planet calls an atmosphere, and was understandably delighted by the discovery. He's so enamoured by the experience, in fact, that he invites Chakotay and Seven to take their helmets off too. Chakotay politely tells him to go do one, before suggesting we might want to get back to Voyager so we can get him checked over by the Doctor. The caves are preventing phone calls, so we'll have to leave to let Voyager know everything's fine, but let's grab Kim first while we're here. Back on the ship, Ensign Conspicuous lets us know that teleporters will be back online shortly. They'll be a bugger all use if we don't get more power soon, though, as we're going to lose life support in a couple of hours. Handily, Kim has the answer. He's already mined a good 20 kilograms of deuterium, which should be enough to get everything running again. He's so pleased with himself that he'd like to stay and mine some more, and hey, why doesn't Chakotay send out some more crew to help? That's not dodgy at all, and also, you won't need to bring those suits. Chakotay's as convinced of this as he was of Paris, and orders them both back to the ship. They'd best hurry, as things are so bad that Tuvok has shut off life support to everywhere except decks 1 and 5, which are the bridge and sick bay. I do hope they moved everybody out of the mess hall on deck 2 before they switched it off. Chakotay calls to let everybody know that we've got some deuterium and that Paris and Kim are still alive. Janeway tells him we can teleport everybody back in a few minutes, and is warned that the doc should be ready to take a look at Paris and Kim. This, of course, is all the excuse the Doc needs to throw everybody out of sickbay, and he delights in doing so. Neelix is ready to argue until he hears that there are patients incoming, upon which he immediately orders everybody out himself. Before leaving, Neelix genuinely thanks the Doctor for his hospitality, and tells him that he'd be happy to return the favour if it's ever needed. It's a show of warmth that takes the Doctor completely by surprise, and leaves him feeling like a complete bastard for the way he's acted. To the teleporter room, where Janeway has decided she wants to go on the beep-boop herself. 
Chicote, Seven, Paris, and Kim are teleported aboard, with the latter two having a bit of a negative reaction once they appear. Perhaps wondering if this was her fuck-up, Janeway orders the person in charge of running the teleporter to run the teleporter, saying Paris and Kim should be shunted over to sickbay. Once there, simple sprays aren't doing anything to help. Janeway and Chicote arrive as the dock sticks up a force field and fills the area around the beds with atmosphere from the planet. That does the job and Paris avoids death for the second time this episode. Dick. The dock runs some tests and we discover that metallic shite from the planet is in the blood of Paris and Kim. He goes on to say that the planet itself has adapted them to make them suitable for life here. That feels like quite a leap to me, but let's see where this is going. Oh, and we don't have a treatment for it yet. Oh, and if we can't fix it, you'll have to continue breathing these gases forever. Oh, and we can't replicate the gases, so we'll have to leave you behind. Jane Wayne Bellana will stay here and science that silver goop, while Chicote and Seven go to the surface to risk infection. I mean, find out more. Kim suggests acting as a guide, and the doc can't think of a reason why not, so off they go. Once outside, Kim starts complimenting the planet, referring to it as breathtaking. Maybe that new personality of his comes with added puns. He's really on board with this planet now, saying it's beautiful. That silver goop might have adjusted more than his lungs, as he's able to see colours and intensities in the landscape that even Seven with her robo-eye can't detect. The sightseeing is cut short when Seven detects humanoid life signs, so we go to take a look. Back on Voyager, Janeway and Balana are doing a science. That silver goop has all manner of chemical elements in it, but upon closer inspection also contains organic components. Is... is this the planet's jizz? Looks like the health and safety protocols of the science lab were written by the same asshole who programmed the holodeck failsafes, as Balana just grabs the slide that silver goop is on. The goop must think this is a sign of affection, as it moves and gives her thumb a cuddle. It must really have liked it too, as it decides to make a copy. Some form of proto-changeling, perhaps. Kim, Chicote, and Seven are still hunting down those life signs. Kim spots them first and is a little uneasy about the whole thing. And with good reason, one of the unconscious bodies on the floor is him. Or the donor that he was copied from if our experiments on Voyager are anything to go by. I wonder if that's why Chicote and Seven were both armed and let Kim go in front of them. And Voyager itself might be in the shit too, or the jizz, anyway. That metallic goop is pooling under one of its little feetsies, and Tuvok reports that we're starting to sink. That's enough for Janeway to call it a day, and she orders us to get ready for takeoff. Tuvok calls Chakotay to let him know that we're leaving, and is a touch surprised to hear that we'll be teleporting five people back. Well, maybe. Unsuited Kim says he belongs here and doesn't want to go back. He scarpers into the caves, their rocks preventing him from being teleported, as the other four return to Voyager. Unsuited Kim will have to fend for himself, as Janeway wants to get the fuck out of Dodge. That silver goop has other plans and grabs hold of Voyager, preventing the takeoff. Thrusters overload and go offline, and Ensign Conspicuous says it'll take half an hour to fix them. Not that it matters, as we'll have already sunk by then. Janeway orders Tuvok to get ready for pooping some science on the silver goop, while she goes to sick bay to check on the Paris and Kim we found in the cave. They're fine, as the suits kept them alive on backup power or some such. Perhaps it had backup oxygen as well. The problem now is what we do with the other Paris. He seems as confused as us by the whole situation, not knowing things were wrong until his donor body arrived in sick bay. One thing he does know is that he really desperately needs to get back to the planet. Tuvok calls to say that science poop is ready, and Janeway tells him to fire. A shaking of the ship coincides with Copy Paris doubling over in pain. He's not alone as Copy Kim calls the ship and begs them to stop firing. Janeway's open to listening and prepares a force field and some of the planet's atmosphere in a transporter room to bring Copy Kim aboard so we can all find out what's going on. He says he and the planet are connected somehow, and that the planet needs Voyager, that's why it can't let it go. Janeway doesn't like the sound of that, and tells Tuvok to do some more pooping. Copy Kim falls over and goes a bit T-1000 before becoming solid again. We stop firing, and Kim has a sudden burst of understanding, and provides us with a lore dump. The goop is a life form, but until encountering us, had never known sentience. Kim and Paris were the first examples of consciousness it had ever experienced, and it wants more but it needs donor material to copy in order to achieve that, which is why it needs Voyager. 
Only, no, it doesn't. Janeway realises it only needs a DNA sample. She makes copy Kim an offer, release them, and she'll talk to the crew. Any who are willing to provide samples can do so, and leave silver goop copies of themselves here. Copy Kim finds this offer agreeable, and Voyager is released. A little later, Voyager prepares for takeoff. The departure is witnessed by a group of at least 85 by my count, who all watch and wave as we fly away. There are some technical problems with this one, obviously. We're equating DNA samples to a person's consciousness, complete with memories, for one thing, which is complete bobbins. Also, I'm pretty sure Starfleet Command would have something to say about us handing over the memories and associated technical knowledge of all those people to a new race whose intentions are unknown even to itself. And that lore dump at the end, rather than teasing it out over time, is a bit heavy-handed for me. It might make more sense from the perspective of the goop having some sort of epiphany, but it's narratively unsatisfying. That said, this episode is hardly the worst we've ever seen. The core concept of a life form requiring input from another to evolve is a solid enough base for a story, and Kim is finally showing a little willingness to be something more than the perpetual new boy. I guess we'll see how long that lasts. Before we finish, there's a point of personal interest I'd like to touch on, that of the Doctor and his relationship to sickbay. He refers to it in this episode as his residence, which accounts for some of the way he reacts when having it invaded. I should mention that this is also, incidentally, a problem that Janeway could have lessened by giving him the quarters he previously asked for. This all hints that the Doc, while certainly more accepted now than when the show started, is still seen by some as lesser. I wonder if Seven would be allocated quarters if she requested them. Contrast this, then, with the way Neelix treats him after being essentially thrown out of sickbay. His own needs are forgotten, and he warmly thanks the Doctor, despite the hostile reception and his obvious glee at their departure. You'll recall that Neelix was openly dismissive of the Doctor in the Season 2 episode Elogium, twice making reference to him being just a hologram. This was also, incidentally, after he'd been thrown out of sickbay. Such a change of attitude is a delightful hint at personal growth, and, I'd like to think, an indicator of the influence Kez had on Neelix in the intervening time. It's also yet another example of how Ethan Phillips can make Neelix shine when he's not used merely for comic relief, and Robert Picardo's reaction as the Doctor is similarly well played. I've made no secret of the fact that the Doc is perhaps my favourite character, so seeing these little interactions are often the highlights for me. End of episode. Hello, it's Anime, it's Best Dog again. If you've not seen me for a while, you might have noticed a slight difference. Long story short, got mixed up in a teleporter, took over the computer of Voyager, got thrown in brig, which wasn't my fault by the way, got teleported out again and now I'm halfway to being a fucking fairy. Needless to say, this is buggered up my Hollywood jobs as they don't do 2D animation anymore. That's all in shows on streaming services now so they can cancel it after two or three seasons. Bastards. Still, it's good to be out of that teleporter thingy, and I doubt I'm the only one who feels that way. I'm a computer. Computer. Oh, woof.